why don't we go ahead and get started here? So uh, let's see. First question that I have for you guys. So let's just say that uh, w what would you say to a DevOps engineer or site reliability engineers? Do we have any SREs here? We have one. Okay, one, two. All right. So you have two in the audience. What would you say to these two gentlemen around protecting their Kubernetes environment? Because they told me that they think everything is okay. It's all secure and it's already protected. What would you say to them? So because I've got the mic, I'll go first. Um, first thing I'd say is out, okay? <laughs> I think the, the second thing is it's not what I would say, it's what I would do. I'd give them a beat down, okay? <laughs> But being serious, um, I think it's about education, okay? About informing people that there's nothing special or magical about containers or about Kubernetes. It doesn't make any of the old stuff go away. In fact, I would say, if we're talking about cyber attacks and things like that, the more we advance and the more we progress with new technologies and things like that, the more avenues that we open up to be yeah. exploited. So just generally speaking, right, if we were to wind the clock back 30 years, try and do a cyber attack on a system, an information system or a company 30 years ago, that's pretty hard because yeah. I don't know if anybody saw the old 80s movie War Games with the old dial-up modems and stuff. You know, yeah. to connect to a mainframe or, or, or whatever, okay, super hard back then because nothing was connected to the outside world and even internally things were hardly connected. Yeah. Whereas if we were to fast forward the clock 30 years from now, then I think the, the attack vectors and things like that will be exponentially more than they are now. So just at a very high level, I would say um, Kubernetes and containers don't fix anything like this or, or they don't make things go away. If anything, they introduce new risks and we need to just put in the effort to make sure that we understand what those risks are. Okay. All right, I appreciate that. And Chris, I know you may have a different, maybe a similar perspective. No, actually, actually very similar. In, in the, as Nigel said very well, uh, this is just the next generation of technology. So the problems that existed before haven't gone away. In fact, at some level, not only are they expanding the attack surface, as, as Nigel brought up, but a lot of the processes and a lot of the tools and a lot of the uh, you know, projects and, and a lot of the vendors you see on the floor here are trying to solve problems that have already been solved in previous generation infrastructures. So yeah. the maturity at some level here is less than things that have come before. And, and I think, you know, we'd probably agree that there may be something that comes after this too, and, th and then you'll have the same problems all over again. They don't go away, they just shift. And so the question is, you know, if you're gonna try and think about your data and protection of it, right. how, how do you do that across um, all the all the various technologies that for just looking at some of the badges here I'm sure not everything you have is kubernetes right don't forget the best practices there just think about how you take those same concepts and take them into this world and Chris you, you mentioned the word shift so that rings a bell in my mind shift left right so I'm sure everyone has heard that terminology before so let's talk a little bit about when you're shifting left make sure that security is also shifting left along with yourself, your processes, your teams, and everything that you have in place. Nigel, what, what advice, I guess, that you would have for everyone in the audience around just making sure that they are also keeping security right in that shift left process? Right, and, and I think the obvious first thing to lead with is that we absolutely do need to shift left. And, and when I say that, I mean, in the past, okay, we've deployed applications to production environments, and once it's gone live, we've realized, ah, now we need to throw on some security that we kind of wish we'd thought about before. Yeah, bolted on. Yeah, bolted on. Um, and you and I, Demetrius, have talked as well. Sometimes we don't even do it until after we've been exploited yeah, right, or attacked. Too late. Uh, and that's like, that would be shift right as far as possible, right? Mm. That's bad. Shift left is let's get security in into the conversations that we have even before we write the first line of code. Ooh. Okay. 
okay. but I, I would say two things about it, and these are probably the challenges. Yeah. Um, it needs to be as frictionless as possible because in that left area, that's left for me, that's left for you guys, okay? Um, it's all about iterating fast. What are our um, product requirements and things like that? And let, let's just deliver against those requirements as fast as possible. So if we go in there and we throw in a bunch of security things that are hard, yeah. then we're gonna get resistance and people are gonna try and bypass us. Mm -hmm. The other thing as my chair swivels, is that this notion of like DevSecOps, um, I, I feel like we need to get beyond the DevSecOps person or the DevSecOps team, because again, people will just try and navigate around them. Okay. It needs to become part of our culture. Mm. So instead of just having that dedicated team, and we might need the dedicated team as that kind of first few steps, but the goal is to get it into everybody's mind so that it's just a part of the process. Okay. And I think in doing that, and I'll, I'll yield the mic after this, um, is trying to yeah. automate as much of it. And we'll, we'll probably come back to going around right. DevSecOps because I, I want to mention a little bit about maybe shadow, shadow IT okay. or whatever. We could talk about that. However, uh, a, a young man came up and he mentioned how much he really enjoyed Chris's keynote. I don't know if you were at the keynote. It's a fantastic keynote this morning. So he mentioned starfish. And there was an analogy around starfish. If, if you cut off one of the limbs, it'll grow back. So Chris, why don't you share the analogy behind the whole resiliency aspect of the starfish? Yeah, yeah sure. First, let me just comment on something Nigel said. Sure. I, th I think part of the shift in shift left is a mindset shift. Right. Oh yeah. It, it's yeah. it's it's really about that, um, and I think one of the challenges is how many of you uh, know people that are like super good developers, but maybe their security skills aren't awesome, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. Right. And th that's what makes DevSecOps hard. Um, not not that there's not progress being made. Some are better at it than others, but but let me address your question sure. now. It there is a difference in my mind between security and resilience. Okay. Mostly, and, and those terms get fuzzy, but security most of the time is people trying to prevent bad things from happening, mm -hmm. right? How do I stop the bad guys? How do I close down the vulnerabilities in my code, right? Yeah. Persistence, or sorry, resilience is more about how do I come back when something does go wrong? And, and if you think it's not gonna, I think that needs to be part of this mindset shift too, because you know, you've seen it. And it's, it's not just the, the bad guys out there getting your security holes, it's things that you just might do in the natural uh, CI CD process and getting something new out there. Suddenly, oh, your data's not there anymore. Ah, now what? And, and so if you want your apps to be resilient, you probably spend a lot of time thinking about, hey, no problem, that, that pod's gonna come up naturally if there's something wrong with it again in the same cluster, or, or maybe I have resiliency between clusters at, at that level. Yeah, where, where we're going to add value is making sure that you think about the data in the same way, and so you make this mind sh shift towards thinking about resiliency to go along with all the great velocity okay. that people are trying to get out of a, of building new things quickly. Got yeah, it. Right. Got it. And Nigel, did you you wanted to add to that, or you're you're good? So I'll just say very quickly. I yeah. think in in the cloud native community. We all understand resiliency when it comes to pods and networks and things like that. We all love the fact that we've got deployments, okay. deployment controllers that will fix things and we design to fail like the starfish, right? It's yeah. designed to fail, that's pretty cool actually. Um, and we always get there first with like, if I can call it the compute stuff. Yeah. And then networking usually comes second and storage and data and I'm an old storage guy, okay, is always last to the party because yeah. it's the hardest, but I would argue it's the most important. Like if you lose okay. a, a replica from a deployment, you know, from a deployment, or if, if the network goes down, recovery is relatively easy. Mm -hmm. If you lose data, um, or if you, your data gets tampered with or something like that, the repercussions are far worse and it's much harder to recover from. Yeah. Therefore, we should really be focusing more on that in some respects than the other things. Okay. 
And what, what, what are some of the other, other things that could actually go wrong? So we have cyber attacks, we have accidental data loss, and we have so many different types of things, misconfigurations. And I've even read a study that misconfigurations may be like the number one thing that goes wrong when it comes to uh, building and maintaining, a, especially a workload environment with containers. So I don't think it's maybe. I think maybe? that is definitely. Okay. Now, because I've got the mic, I'm just, do you don't mind, Chris? Yeah. Right? So yeah. just a very quick story, OK? Because I've sure. just said I used to be a storage person, right? Um, I used to have developers and even some operations people come to me and say, a particular application or infrastructure, we don't need backup and recovery in this environment, right? Because we're replicating across sites. Yeah. And I, yeah, well, Chris is laughing because he, he gets it, right? And I'm sure a lot of you do, but I would be like, are you kidding me, right? They're like, yeah, but if something happens, we just go to the other site. And I'm like, OK, that's for if we lose the site, mm -hmm. we can hard work, fail over. Or if we lose a system at site A, we can fail over to site B. But if somebody tampers with your data or deletes something, and it can be a misconfiguration that we yeah. talked about, it can be a bad actor within the organization or whatever, if they tamper with that data, we've faithfully replicated that tampering to the remote site. Yeah. Even if we're going asynchronous replication, we're not going to recover in time. So I think there's some mindsets and some fundamental understanding of our applications, okay. of the infrastructure that supports them and the yeah. tools that support them, that we don't make the mistakes of thinking, oh, well, because we replicate, we don't need this or that. Yeah. Yeah. I came across that so often in the past. Makes sense. I'll just say a huge plus one to what he said. You, okay. you, don't, you don't want to take the problem and just replicate it elsewhere, right? You always have to go back to what's that last known good copy of your data so you can keep moving forward. Okay, so what, what do you think is maybe one of the most complex thing that, let's say someone sitting in the audience, we have a few, I'm sure everyone is DevOps oriented, cyber reliability engineers and platform engineers, et cetera. Maybe one piece of advice for everyone out in the audience to maybe do their jobs a lot better when it comes to iterating fast and also making sure that they're doing it in a fashion that they are also keeping things safe and secure as they are actually working and moving fast. Yeah, I'll give it a shot, and, and I, think, shot. All right. um, I, I think uh, fr from my perspective as somebody with a data background, don't, don't forget about that, uh, because that, that is the heart and soul of what you're building your apps to work against. And, and so it goes back to this mind shift that you need to make. Yeah. How do you think through not just what you're you know, coding on your local uh, instance, but particularly in a distributed environment, uh, particularly across multiple CSPs if you're doing that, or a hybrid uh, scenario. Um, how do you make sure that you get the resilience in, in your head and at least ask the questions, even if you're not the expert on how to solve for it, so that you anticipate that? Yeah. So, so that if there is a misconfiguration or a fat fingers in the mix or what have you, right, or malware, you, you can address it. Because at the end of the day, it's really about you building the apps to keep your business running, and your business, at the end of the day, runs on your data. And so that should just be part of the, the, the mindset you should have going into solving these problems as right. you think about all the new functionality you're rolling out and okay. how fast you can do that. And, and it is, it's a balance, I think you said it well, Demetrius, between velocity, at, including security, and, and resilience that, that helps the business the most in right. what you're delivering. So for take home points, I mean, th there's probably so many, aren't there? I I'm reminded of in, in the early days of my IT career, we used to talk about the onion, didn't we? All the different layers of the onion. Yeah. Fr from external firewalls to passes that get you into the data center and stuff like that. I think when it comes to our data, there are so many new things in the last few years, like ransomware and stuff like that. So. We almost have to apply that multi-layered onion approach to just protecting our data. So we, we hinted before, replication alone is not enough, but it's a layer. No, it's not, right. And then there's backup. But of course, backup is useless if you cannot recover. So 
it, ju just take that multi-layered approach. And I would, I would just want to finish by saying I think that by protecting your data, if I can say you're protecting all the things, and when yeah. I say that, you're protecting your customers, you're protecting your business that you work for, you're protecting your own employment and your own career, because as this becomes um, more and more important, nobody ever wants anybody to lose a job or anything like that. And if, we, if we're not protecting our data, we could potentially lose our jobs or our yeah. teammates as well. Right, right. So we're not just protecting the data and our customers and stuff, we're protecting you and I and, and all of us here. Yeah. And if we, and the flip side is if we're not, then when we're doing a, a, a disservice to our customers, yeah. to our business, to our teammates, to ourselves. And did you want to say something else? Yeah, I'll just, I'll just okay. add, add a, an analogy that may help, right? Cause I'll go back to your velocity question. Yeah. So if you're going to go out and drive a fast car as fast as you can, right? Hopefully, number one, you're wearing a seatbelt. That's the security bit, yeah? But also, at least here in the US, hopefully you have an insurance policy, right? For when things may go wrong. And yeah. so all three of those things together, I think, gives you the resilience you really need to do your best work. So that's, that's And fine. maybe a question on artificial intelligence. Are you guys tired of hearing about AI? Or you I are? <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of here to stay, but I, I, Nigel, I know you have something to say about AI, but you have to be careful what you say. I do. <laughs> yeah, because anything you say about AI, I feel like in two or three months, if anybody's watching it back, they're going to think, what a fool, because it, it, it's, it's iterating it's so quickly. It's fast, yeah. Um, yeah. I, I'm quite interested, actually. So um, raise your hands if you're rubbish with YAML. I'm going to put both of mine up. Uh, I'm rubbish. So I can maybe manage 20 lines of YAML before it's a little bit too much for me to digest. Now, a large Kubernetes environment is hundreds, thousands of lines of YAML, and the chance for that human misconfiguration to come in there, ooh, okay? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So I, I feel like AI going forward has the potential to be the ultimate Kubernetes expert or the ultimate Kubernetes help desk to help us fix problems when they go long. They, it, it can, you know, if you've got an AI that's monitoring multiple hundred Kubernetes clusters, it mm -hmm. will learn fast, yeah. okay? And it will help us fix things, but I feel that almost the best part about it is we could feed it configurations and it will potentially be really good at saying, well, actually, if this happens, yeah. stuff that like for me at least, and some of you might be like a YAML Meisters, okay? But for me, I, I just, it's, it's lines of code that I'm like, Whereas right, I right. think AI could be a lot better than me. Yeah, I, I really like that response. And someone came by the booth maybe 30 minutes ago, and he mentioned that he had a large Kubernetes environment and everything was on-prem. And he also wanted to know, he had state, state, stateful workloads, right? And he wanted about the persistent storage, and he wanted to know how do you keep them safe and secure. And he mentioned, oh, do you have immutable storage or anomaly detection or whatever the case may be. And my question for you, Chris, is how important is anomaly detection today? Well, look, there are many, many different use cases for yeah. AI. I think Nigel was talking about how, how can it help uh, reduce the complexity of managing a distributed environment, which is definitely yeah. one of them. I think, I think right. you're touching on another, which is more about uh, how, how do you use it to look at your data, for example. Okay and understand um, because as you're protecting it, as you're backing it up, for example, it, does it suddenly look like it's taking off in terms of the, the, the size of it? That, that may be an early warning of there's an encryption event going on, yeah? yeah. So you're sort of yeah. in the middle of it. That's, that's one thing. There may be other things like you see a bunch of simultaneous uh, logins from an admin password that like only one person should have. That's another right, indicator, yeah. right? So can, can you use uh, AI there to help fend off or at least catch things in the, in the uh, process mm -hmm. so you can quickly know basic things that then may automate, and again, back to reducing complexity, things like, hey, if that's going on, let's make sure that I stop all my um, retiring backup snapshots 
because yeah. even if it costs me storage, because I may want to hang on to those because that may be the last known good image of my data I need to go back to to get that starfish-like quality of being right. resilient again. Right. So, so yeah, I think I think tons of possible use cases out there. We, we, at Veritas, as, as you know, Demetrius, we're looking at this, this bigger concept of what we call autonomous data management. How do we use AI for good to reduce the complexity of things that you shouldn't have to pay attention to if you have a short attention span <laughs> reading through YAML files and such, right? And, and, and how do we apply that um, in, in our context in a way that, that makes it easier for you to focus on ideally more of the business logic and, and the speed of, of building new, exciting, innovative things? Yeah. And I, I also want to talk a little bit about maybe one thing in the book that you are excited about, and I know you're probably, you're working on something else. I'm not sure if you have announced it yet or you want to say something about it. What, what do you think uh, the audience would like to hear about Okay, that? so very quickly, um, I'm one of the believers that um, WebAssembly is a, in the process of powering the next wave of cloud computing. Mm. So the cloud started out on virtual machines. We moved to containers that were smaller, faster, more lightweight, more portable. And WebAssembly is coming as a third wave that is also, compared to containers, smaller, more lightweight, more portable. However, of course, containers haven't done away with virtual machines, which didn't do away with mainframes if we go far enough back, right? Yeah. WebAssembly is not going to do away with containers, but it's going to become another um, another target or, or another way that we can deploy our applications. And I think going forward, it may eat into containers the way containers has eaten into virtual machines. Yeah. And maybe one thing. Go on. What is WebAssembly? And maybe I'm just oh, naive. I don't, I don't know. So <laughs> one on one, really quick. <laughs> so WebAssembly, other than being the future of cloud computing, and smaller, faster, more lightweight, I would say it is a, a new, it's, so it's a binary instruction set format, so you can write your applications in C, Rust, Python, Go, things okay. like that, compile them to WebAssembly, and they will run anywhere that has a WebAssembly runtime. Okay. So build once, run anywhere. Got it. Delivering on the promise for once. Okay. Well, um, I don't know if we have time to, maybe one question from the audience. Someone up front, we have time. Question. So I'm yeah. going to pass him the mic just so it gets picked up. So what is your recommendation for zero trust uh, for Kubernetes? Ooh. You want to take that one? <laughs> I, I think you got to start there at making the assumption that, you know, he talked about the, the layers of the onion. That model's dead in my mind, mm. right? You, you, even, even at, um, you know, you just have to assume that every time one service talks to another, you have to authenticate. It's it's just the only way to move forward. Given I mean, I mean, look, the number one attack from a ransomware standpoint these days is people are going after your admin credentials. Why? Yeah. They have the keys to the kingdom, right? So you got to use something, and there, there's some vendors out here that help you with that. Like at least a new password every time, right? So it's not the same credentials. Mm -hmm. So you just have to make that assumption um, as as a baseline, and then that goes into this whole shift left mindset we've talked a lot about already. And, um, and, and if you look at it that way, uh, I, I mean, you know, apart from storing your credentials in, in GitHub and stuff, right? It's, it's yeah. far past that. It's like as things communicate, whether it's WebAssembly or it's containers or it's VMs, that every time you form that connection, authenticate. That's how you build trust. And, and if you haven't done that, you're assuming trust and that's the trap. Oh, go ahead. Just, just very quickly, I don't really have anything to add other than my comment about the onion layers is I just I feel like a lot of this, we mustn't forget all of the old stuff. Um, yeah. And I, I did want to say something on, on, oh yeah, so on this always authenticating and, and you know, we, we've talked briefly as well that yeah. I, I feel, and this is not necessarily directly answering your question, but I feel like our development and test environments and things need to reflect our production environments in this kind of respect a lot more yeah so that we're greasing if you will that pathway to production because 
we're not going to be able to survive anymore where you know our, our, our development and test environments are wide open and anything goes there and then suddenly we try and push to production and it's like uh -uh, that's not happening so we need to start the, and this is the shift left thing we've right. got to shift everything left yeah especially your mind all right yes. any more any more questions maybe one more the mic so it, it seems to be the new buzzword is platform engineering yeah, the new buzzword is platform engineering right it seems devops is a subset of platform engineering kind of thing and the abstraction layer in front of devops is becoming platform engineering. so i want to hear from you i want to hear from you what what does platform engineering is for you uh, so <laughs> thank you I hate the question, actually. <laughs> it, it's a really good question, but I'm a little bit jaded about all of this DevOps, platform ops. In some of my books and stuff, I've started writing XOps because I can't keep up with what's going to come next. Um, I, I do feel like, and I don't know if this goes to your question so much, but as soon as we start handing things over to the platform people, these are the people that run the business. Okay, so I come from an operations background, so maybe I'm a little bit biased on that. But I, <laughs> without, without getting attacked by people, um, I know that developers have matured a lot over the years. I'm going to have to run away here. Um, but I still feel like <laughs> the operations people are the grown-ups within the organization. So I do see it as a positive shift. Anything that's moving things more towards the platform side of things, I think, is a, a sign of maturity. Um, but I, I'm not a big fan of using terms like that personally. I, I, I prefer just the things that we've talked about. about Call it whatever you want. We just need to be shifting things left and maturing. I don't know if that's a. Do you, Chris? Do you have? Yeah. Is that, is that good? Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I think it's a balance, right? Because developers want all the freedom they could possibly have, and and the ops team um, wants to restrict choices in a way that's going to make sure things stay up and running. And and so I do think it, this, this whole you know platform as a product discussion, right, is related to this, and 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 it's a balance. And so different orgs are going to do different things there. But I do think, to Nigel's point, thinking that way, maybe how we bake in some of these best practices around security, for example, right? He mentioned they're like, let's make sure at least uh, your staging environment looks like prod, if, if not dev, yeah? But um, you, need, you need that thinking, you need the help from the, the, the more ops side of the DevOps community, working with the dev team, depending on your organization and what the culture is there, and that is part of it, by the way, to get that balance right, whatever we call it. All right, let's, let's give both Chris and Nigel a round of applause for sharing their insights. One more thing. No, no, I just want to see if I can get a panoramic photo with everybody. Oh. So nobody move. I'm just uh -oh. kidding. <laughs> but I'm going to get a quick photo if that's all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. I just set it up for pano. Don't breathe. Okay. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you know those panos and anybody moves and you've got them three times? Yeah. Yeah, somebody on the end needs to run around to the other side real quickly, right? I hope you're all smiling. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thanks for coming by, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all so much. Let's hear it one more time. One more time.